start if you want to start. Well, I don't care. You can start. Oh, holy cow. Oh, start that again. The people talk a lot about breed and what breed yeah. is going to be best. And the answer is there's probably a family of dogs within any breed that can fit. So the key is being aware that it's happening 15 birds or so in the cubby. And the cubby all went to my right, and I was facing the puppies. You can communicate to a dog right. They can learn it in one time. Well, enjoy. Hey, thanks for joining us for this podcast. Before we get started, we just wanted to let you know about a promotion that we're doing. We're working to promote our online video library at teasdoghouse.com. In that library, we have videos that show all our different programs step by step, how we like to train our dogs and, and get the most out of our dogs. So if you'd be interested in that, check us out, teasdoghouse.com. Use the promo code podcast to get five days free to see what it's like. And then if you like it, stick around. It's just $25 a month and we've got a lot of information on there and we're putting up more information all the time. Thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoy the podcast. Welcome to T's Doghouse. I'm Talmadge Smedley. This is my son Tanner Smedley. And we're pleased that you've joined us for this discussion. So this discussion, we, we wanted to set out and, and have a discussion with each other and include you in it. Um, talk about bird dogs and what makes bird dogs great. Maybe some of the experiences we've had but ultimately how we think and how the bird dog thinks. And what we can do as handlers and trainers to help the bird dog become the greatest bird dog it can possibly be. Yeah, yeah, we've been talking and we get a lot of comments from people as they come and either their dog's going through our program in a board and tape train type situation or we've helped a lot of people train their dogs or they come out and we'd kind of walk them through the process and then through our videos now you know so we've had a lot of people that we've worked with and their bird dogs and we get a lot of comments about you know i never thought of it like that before or, that makes a lot of sense or i've never seen that way of doing it or even things like sitting we teach all of our dogs to sit and lay yeah. down because we want them to be able to be dogs that could come into the house that can hang out with you on the porch while you're grilling you know all of those type of things and so we get comments from people you teach your dogs to sit and lay down don't they sit and lay down on their birds and the answer is never right. <laughs> we don't ever deal with that but it's because our program is structured differently than a lot of programs you'd see on youtube and things like that and maybe more of the traditional ways of thinking about training dogs as far as the pigeons and stuff go and so and so we were talking about that and why we get those comments and why we see those things so much because we get them from almost everybody that <laughs> yeah. comes through and I think it it really comes down to our focus on the way the dog's thinking and so there's a lot of techniques and a lot of programs for helping dogs actions be like we want them to you know whether that's with the in the house stuff with sitting and laying down and going to the bed and you know all of those type of things or out in the field with the idea of teaching a dog to point and going through the training process so your dog's ready to point birds and you know there's a lot of techniques and programs for helping control the dog's actions whatever those actions might be that you're wanting to great point to have but but there's not nearly as much talk about well why is the dog making its choices in the first place because if we can change the way that they're thinking their actions will change every time you know it's that's reliable they're going to act in the way that matches their thinking and so that's been our obsession well really your obsession and for 30 years or whatever than yeah. my obsession recently but is understanding why the dogs are thinking the way they're thinking and how that's causing their actions and then what we can do to influence the way those dogs are thinking to shape the actions that we want right and i think it's allowed us to create a program that we use most of our training is done on pigeons in a small field, a field that you could find. I live out in Layton, which is a very populated area, and I could find fields bigger than the one that we run in, you know? And so it's, it's a thing that, it's a program where you can have your dog that lives at your house in the suburban area, and you only get to hunt with during the season a couple times. You can still do a training program that gets your dog ready for the wild birds and replicates the process of the wild birds. But, but that real difference is just in how we are trying to help the dogs think a certain way. Yeah. I love your point about the thinking because that's really, to me, that's what we're doing. We talk about training and, and we talk about the dog's actions and what we want the dog to do. But when, when I was training horses um, full time and, and at the beginning of my career, that I had the great opportunity to work with a tremendous horseman. 
And that's what he would always say is, is we're not training the horse's actions. We're training the horse's mind. We're, we're working with the horse's mind, not just its physical actions. And, and I've carried that on with my view of the dogs, I think, is just why are they choosing to do what they're doing? There's a reason why they make the choices that they make. And, and being able to have some effect on that reasoning, understand the dog's goal, its, its desire, and then helping it choose actions that will get that desire in a way that also meets my desire, you know, that's the key. It's all about the thinking. But the way we're thinking has a great effect on the way the dog is thinking. And, um, and so that's really, that's what we like to delve into is, yeah. is, you know, talking about the way to think. So I wanted to, I want to start out, you know, telling, telling a story about my first dog. It's my second dog. My first dog was a dog named Rusty. He was an Irish setter. Um, he had, I think he had a relatively low drive to find birds in the first place. And then after the first gunshot, he had a very high desire to avoid birds altogether. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first experience is, is immediately we had a gun shy dog. We had a dog that would blink birds. We could even identify, and we were just hunting released birds, just pen raised birds. Mm -hmm. And we could identify the bush that the bird was in because that's the one the dog ran back to the truck when it got close to, you know what I mean? It was so, so severe, probably a big, big problem with genetics that he really didn't have the genetics to be a bird dog like we were hoping. Um, and also our, our introduction to the gun was very poor and that, that caused things to really go yeah. south. So that's a great example of how our actions can, can change the way the dog thinks and views things. But my second dog, I still didn't know much, um, but I called her Babe. She was an English setter, um, but I'd done some research and I tried to find dog, a puppy out of dogs that hunted a lot. I didn't know anything about pedigrees or anything like that, but I asked a lot of questions to the people who I, who I contacted looking for a puppy. And, and this family did a lot of hunting and, and that owned the mother and the, the guy that owned the sire did a lot of hunting. So I felt like I was getting a dog that had some better genetics. And I got that dog and she was an amazing bird dog. It was a lot of years and quite a few dogs after her before I had a dog that I felt like was a bird dog similar to her. And my knowledge was nil. <laughs> I did learn enough that, that I was careful about introducing her to the gun and at least careful enough that she didn't end up gun shy. Or maybe her drive was high enough that the gun just never mattered anyway. Because we've seen all those levels in a dog. Some dogs, I don't think it would matter one bit how you introduce the gun. It's not going to bother them. Mm -hmm. And other dogs, that if you didn't introduce it right, you would have you really curtailed your progress right there. So we got through all that, and then we just started going hunting. And, and I'd just run her, and I was excited when she'd go on point, and I'd hustle up there. And um, if, if she flushed the bird, I wasn't happy anymore, and I was bugged. But I, I, didn't, I never taught her woe ever in her life. I didn't, but, but I was bugged. And then she'd find another bird, and she'd point it, and... I'd hustle up there and I'd kill it and I, I don't know, I, I didn't really do any kind of formal training. Outside of we planted a few pigeons in the backyard because we'd heard you could and I had homing pigeons so me and my buddy planted a few pigeons in the backyard. I remember doing it a few times and she learned how to point the neighbor's chickens um, and until the neighbor requested that I no <laughs> longer use their chickens for training. That's when the pigeons came in. <laughs> and then the season started and then we were out into wild birds and, and we just shot them if we could get to them. And if you couldn't, you didn't. And when she was a four or five year old dog, all she did was point them and we shot them. And, and she didn't, I don't ever remember retrieving a bird for me ever. Um, so she wasn't big on the retrieve, but for some reason, when I got there and she stayed on point and I got there and shot the bird, uh, she thought that was a good deal. She didn't care to pick it up, but she was willing to do that for me. And, and so that was really interesting to me because I didn't know, whoa, I didn't have any way to tell her not to move up on that bird. I just hustled up there and shot it. Boy, she turned into a phenomenal dog, and we killed hundreds and hundreds of birds over that dog. Um, but, but very little formal training. And I thought that was really interesting as I started to learn more and to train more. And now, especially as I've had the opportunity to work with so many people, 
I hear so many stories about people that got a dog when they were a kid, and their hunting dog when they were a kid was a phenomenal bird dog. Mm -hmm. And I was talking the other day to a, a customer of mine that, a good friend, and, and I've worked a lot of dogs for him, and he, um, he was telling me about his first dog. And it was a German short hair pointer. And he told me that that dog, he just, same thing, him and his brothers, they just went, and they just took the dog, when it found birds and pointed them for them, they killed them. And if it didn't point them, they couldn't kill them. And he'd tell me stories about his dog running down these heavy ditch banks like they used to have back in the day before they learned how to clean them up so good by burning them and by spraying them and by, yeah. by taking the field edges right to the edge and by piping the ditches. And, you know, back when we actually had habitat for birds and farmed in a way that would allow the birds to do well, yeah. they'd go down these big ditches heavily overgrown and he said his dog had run down the outside of that ditch and then it'd dive into the ditch and then it'd start coming back and then it'd point birds and it'd pin them between him and them and he said I, I don't know how to teach i'd never taught it to do that it just was trying to figure out how to get that bird pinned down so that they could come in and shoot the bird and same thing never taught the dog whoa never never any kind of formal training yeah. you know just lived with the dog and took the dog hunting and the dog became an amazing wild bird dog and did amazing things with those birds. I thought that was pretty interesting that the first dog that people owned, how often I've heard that, the first dog I owned was the best wild bird dog I owned, you know? Yeah. That was my, my greatest wild bird dog. Yeah, I think that we see that a lot and we see a lot of people out here that they follow that process almost primarily, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, where it's almost the wild bird purist, if you will, where that's the only place the dog gets any sort of training is on the wild birds. And so, and we see that where it's because of the progression, you know, the, you talked about your dog, where if you got there, you shot the birds and if you didn't, the birds got away. And pretty soon that dog put those dots together and said, you know, I'm going to figure out how to keep these birds here until he can get here, otherwise the game's over, and that's no fun. And so there was a lot of incentive and a lot of desire to point the birds, and because then you could get there and you could shoot them. And I think that's really interesting because it shows that there is a natural progression where the dogs will learn to naturally point <laughs> if mm -hmm. given the time and the, the capacity to do so. And that's really the core idea we've centered our whole program on is following the natural progression, the same progression you would see happen on wild birds, but replicating it on pigeons in a smaller area where we're able to get to because we don't have the yeah. time or resources to run on wild birds every single day. And so this allows us to be able to do that and to do it in a way that prepares the dogs to go out onto the wild birds. Yeah. Because I think a lot of times we hear about pigeon training and it in a negative light, right? That it it messes Using dogs up, can... that it causes problems, that it makes it so your dog can't handle the wild birds. You know, there's a lot of things that we hear about it, but really it comes down to that the pigeons weren't used in a way that prepared your dogs for wild birds. Yeah. It, it was kind of its own game. And so we've really focused on trying to figure out how to train in a way that prepares the dogs to go on to wild yeah. birds rather yeah. than just preparing the dogs to do what we're, yeah. <laughs> the game we've invented in the field, if you will, yeah. you know. Ba you know, that first dog that I had, Babe, she lived to be, I think, 14 when we lost her. I bought her when in my 12, 12th year. And so, um, you know, that, that got me into adulthood. And along the way, I raised some puppies from her. And, and those puppies, I was learning to train a dog. I was reading the books. I was learning that whoa was something to do, mm -hmm. to say. And, and I had a number of dogs, and none of them ever became what Babe was. Probably never had the opportunity to become what Babe was. But, but by the time Babe passed away, I was, in, I was working on a career, putting a career together, and I, I didn't have time to be into the wild birds and to do, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, so I, was, I, had to, I had to lean on pigeons. And, and it was an interesting process because the information that was out there for me using pigeons, it, it did stifle my dog's development, I felt like. And we'll talk a second about that, which you were leading up to. And so I, I didn't, that's why I think I, I didn't have a wild bird dog like like Babe, or a bird dog like Babe, because we, back then, we hunted a lot on on the, the pheasant farms, we call them. And, um, but but I, I noticed that I was causing some problems, and then I got into the field trialing a little bit more and, and had the opportunity to run with, 
with some great dogmen, you know, that, that trained primarily on wild birds. And I would only get to go up there every few years. I mean, every few, uh, a few times a year. Mm -hmm. And so my dog's opportunity to be on wild birds a few times in a year, and then during the hunting season, the handful of times I got to go hunting, um, I had to start getting creative. And I started to realize that the traditional ways that I'd seen to work on work with pigeons weren't um, weren't benefiting me mm -hmm. enough because my dogs weren't handling the wild birds well at all, and um, and so I knew I needed more wild birds. And then I met some guys and I hunted with some guys that were wild bird guys, <laughs> you know, 150 plus days a year that they hunted, and they hunted all kinds of species. And out here in the West. You know, we can travel and be into all, a lot of different species, you know, of birds. And, and that's a pretty normal thing is to drive, you know, to get to the places that you can hunt those wild birds. And, and so, um, you know, I started to rub shoulders with them and with the trainers that I knew that, that trained primarily on wild birds. And then these hunters, man, I started to see dog work that was pretty amazing dog work. Yeah. And they weren't working on pigeons and they were anti-pigeon a lot of times. Yeah. You know, they were as little as you could possibly do with the pigeon. You, you might use it a little bit to introduce a few things to your dog, but, but then you wanted to get out on those wild birds. And, and that got my mind thinking, why is that? Why is the pigeon, the dog loves them, and I got my dogs to point the pigeons, but why were the pigeons, why was the training I was doing with pigeons not helping me in the wild birds the way that I wanted it to in the wild birds? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an important point because we're going to, that's what all the beautiful artwork on the board here. That's Thank you. Thank you for calling it beautiful. Artwork. Um, and Thanks for giving me the art. credit that's due also. This is my yeah, artwork. Is artwork. Yeah, I don't want anybody <laughs> taking credit for this. Yeah, and so that's, that's really the, the focus of this video. What we want to be is on explaining there's really, I feel like I've been kind of in a unique situation where I came in to the picture with the dogs I don't know when I was 12 or so maybe is when I really started to go and work dogs yeah. in the field with you. Um, but not as a trainer. More a little as just, older than I that because I remember we had the little break open, the, the double barrel shotgun oh, yeah. that had the little caps. You'd the put caps, the caps in the back the of the shotgun. shells <laughs> and then you'd walk in to help flush and shoot uh -huh. the pigeons. <laughs> yep. So you were a little younger so, than 12 probably the first yeah, time. Yeah, probably, out. I don't know, 9 or 10 even. Um, but it wasn't that I was involved in the training. It was just yeah. that I really liked dogs and I liked hanging out with dad and so... I'd get to come to, to work with the dogs. And so I never really came at it until the past, I don't know, six years from a training perspective. I just came at it from a have fun with the dogs perspective. Yeah. And then now that I've been older and involved in the training, I've, we've come at it from kind of two areas where we've been filming the online courses and videos and kind of instructional type stuff. So I spent a lot of time in the online world watching YouTube videos from other groups, other trainers, seeing what other methods people are using. And then I've also gotten to spend a lot of time with some of these amazing wild bird hunters that you've mentioned and running dogs and seeing their dogs and hearing some of their philosophies and stuff. And really in the whole bird hunting community, I feel like there's, well, upland bird hunting community, there's kind of two camps, if you will. There's the wild bird purists, if you can call them that, where it's not always anti-pigeon, but sometimes pretty anti-pigeon where the wild birds is the only place yeah. you really want to run your dogs. And then there's another camp of people that is very pigeon oriented and you need to teach your dog to point and to stay where it is once it smells the birds and things like that. And these, the both camps kind of fight against each other a little bit. I feel like where you see a little yeah. bit of infight in the upland community between these two ideologies. And, and so we're going to walk through on the board, both ideologies yeah. and explain what the dog is thinking in both situations, both on the wild birds, why the dog's making its decisions the way it is, and in the uh, I'm not even, the pigeon camp, for lack of a better term. I don't know the traditional pigeon training. I don't know what to yeah. term it specifically, but um, but what it's what the dogs are thinking and why they're making their decisions in that way of thinking as yeah. well. And I think that. Uh, one of the places that's where we kind of bridge a gap a little bit where we've seen both worlds and we're trying to <laughs> develop a middle ground if you will that is a way of working on pigeons for the people that don't have access to the wild birds like the real yeah. wild bird hunters do and 
but also in a way that's going to prepare them for wild birds yeah. so that yeah kind of bridging that gap if you will between those two camps and two thought processes but i do think it's important what we're going to walk through and understanding why the dogs are making the decisions they're making yeah. under both ideologies because what you're trying to accomplish with your dog is going to be influenced by whatever method you're following so understanding that <laughs> allows you to I guess really shape a dog that's going to fit your needs and what you really want to be doing with your dog. Yeah. I think a couple of things leading into this that I wanted to mention. I, I like what you said. I, um, there's the training that influences the dog and how the dog's going to work and how good a bird dog it's going to be. Um, the way it's handled by the humans makes a big difference. But the other flip side of that is the genetics mm -hmm. that you start with. And um, the genetics can create some real challenges because we can have dogs that have a lot of point and other dogs that, and uh, dogs that have a lot of point and start wanting to point quite early. And on the other end, you can have dogs that they, they seem to have no point. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if they do start pointing, it's quite a bit later um, in, their, in their development. And, and, you know, we could, we could talk about pos positive and negatives on both sides of that, just like we're going to talk about, you know, the two extremes here um, with the, the different ways of approaching bird dogs. But, um, but, but it's important to recognize that, you know, different challenges are coming with different dogs because genetically they're made up different. They're going to be, mm -hmm. they're going to find, naturally they're going to find different parts of this whole situation more exciting, you know. And so we do need to think about that and recognize that different genetics are going to create different challenges. Um, and then on the other side of it, we want to we want to talk about here on the board what you know man's training method. <laughs> if we just mm -hmm. say that the the way that that somebody man's just kind of naturally starts nature's thinking. Nature's training method, yeah, I think, or, yeah, versus nature's training method, and um, and then where they blend. And of course, man's training method changes according to what they learn but if we just went with the extreme side of the people trying to control the dog versus the dog learning from the wild birds because that's what that's what we hear is you know oh you get the pigeons and all that and you're you're trying to do this training and then your dog becomes less of a wild bird dog <laughs> or or has a harder time with the wild birds versus the guys that say just let the wild bird do the training yeah. so we'll, we'll we'll diagram that out a little bit um so I guess I'll move into that unless yeah, there's something else you wanted to, to mention. And I don't, um, hopefully you can see this. I, the, the lines are a little bit lighter or skinnier than, they should be able to, that they should and, show but, up on the but camera. It should show up. Okay. So I, I want to talk about the natural process that a dog goes through. If it was just allowed to just run on wild birds. Mm-hmm. First, you know. let's describe the diagram. That's a bird. If you, I'm sure you Did could you, tell, but if you, I mean, I would think, tell, like, I don't think we even need to point that out because that's <laughs> obviously a bird. And then we've got a scent cone. You may have thought it was a bird with laser eyes, but it's a scent cone. And then the wind, of course, showing the direction. And then zones. We'll talk about these zones. Um, would be after the flight of the bird and understanding the the thought process. So we've got the we've got the, the pre-flight zone. So. That's back to here behind the bird, that's, that's pre-flight. The bird has not left the ground. Then we have the kill zone, we could call it. This is the 40 yard zone. Um, and the 40, I mean, that's a loose, that's a loose thing. You know, it might be 60 yards, it might, but, but this zone over here, this is the flyaway zone. This is the zone in which the bird still might come down, right? So mm -hmm. if we're shooting, so I put 40, you know, but I mean, if you shoot as well as me, that might extend out to 100. 20 or 30. Or if, I mean, you might say if you shoot as poorly as me, because I got one BB in and it took the, <laughs> the bird 150 yards before it finally folded. Um, anyway, but we're for, for just definition's sake, we're going to talk about a 40 yard or so zone there. So if, if we're thinking of the, the young dog coming into the wild birds, um, and it, it's just going to run all natural. That dog is going to come in and it's going to be running along and it's going to run into some birds. Those birds are going to get up and fly 
and that dog's going to watch him fly off maybe the first time. But as time goes on, it's going to be like, oh, maybe I can go find that thing. This is getting pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And they're going to start chasing that, that bird. And so they chase the bird all the way through the zones. And then as that dog starts working, something starts to happen. This zone out here, the far edge of this flyaway zone, that dog starts to realize maybe the game isn't working the way he wanted it to work. You know, and things start happening out here in this flyaway zone, like their feet are getting sore, they're running out of air, getting the bird's hot. getting, they're getting hot, the bird's getting so far away it's getting less exciting because the bird is clear, clear out there, and so I'm going to give up on the chase because it's gotten away, right? Mm -hmm. And so all those things start happening, and, and I'm going to color that black. That starts the avoidance. The dog starts shifting into... I want to catch it, what the dog can gain, and instead the dog starts shifting into, I want to avoid this, right? So he pulls off, and the next bird that he comes in contact with, he starts to realize he can smell it, and he smells it right before it flies. And then it flies, and, he, and it's all exciting. You know, he smells it, he turns, it's exciting, the bird's pretty close, and then it gets into the flyaway zone, and nature starts to add the dark colors, right? But over here on this side, he starts thinking, I'm going to start slowing down when I smell that. I need to get a little bit more careful. I need to get a little sneakier. And so he starts to catch a whiff of that bird, and he turns, but he starts to slow down. But he doesn't slow down soon enough, fast enough. Maybe he's not paying enough attention to his nose, or maybe he's running too fast to pick the scent up until he's way too close to the bird. But the bird gets up, and he goes through the whole thing again. But he starts to realize he maybe got a little closer or he almost got stopped in time. And the dog will start to decide to do some pointing or slow down, or he'll slow down his pattern to use the wind to tell him where the birds are. So we start seeing him slow down out here and try to avoid this far fly away. I don't know how long that's gonna take. Each dog's different. Some of them in their first season, they start putting that together really good. And some of them, you know, it takes late in the second season on a hunt when their feet have worn off. We've seen this before. Mm -hmm. And they're tender-footed, and they're tired, and you've hunted them four or five days in a row, and, and they're just hammered. And then you go put them into birds, and they start saying, this is no fun. Yeah. This flyaway thing, I'm getting no joy from running and chasing. And they're slowed down, and in their slower pace, they catch the wind sooner. Because they're moving slower, they start to, to be able to make decisions they couldn't make before, and they start slowing down and getting pointed. And then that dog, I am convinced, gets the drug. Dogs love to be on point. Mm -hmm. they, they love it. They stand there. They drink it in. They, they vibrate. They, they like to be on point. That is a good sensation for them. And that's where they're a little different than a regular wild animal. right? Because a wild animal is pursuing simply to get the food, yeah. to get the bird to eat. But these dogs, they love to be on point, and some of them have so much point, they're never going to catch a bird, mm -hmm. right? Well, most of the pointing dogs will, don't catch a bird. I very seldom hear a story of a bird that got caught, unless it was a sick bird, or it was stuck in cover where it couldn't get out fast enough, or something yeah. like that. But um, Yeah, so the dog starts pointing here, and it's getting these, these real strong, positive experiences pointing. And it points for a little bit, and then it comes in, tries to get closer and closer, the bird flies. But remember, this zone in the dog's mind is starting to become a, an avoidance zone. And that dark is getting more and more where he wants to avoid this fly off. And this is becoming really positive. I'm going to leave it white. I thought about drawing pluses out here to say how, how good it's getting. And we could. You know, we could draw some pluses to let you know that this is... This is becoming a very positive experience for the dog, something that it, it tries to do. And this is becoming something it tries to avoid. So if, if you consider that, this is the pluses, it gets more negative the farther the bird gets away. And that's the important thing is seeing white. In my mind, I see it in shades. So this is white, this is clean, this is pristine, this is almost sacred. And then this, this gets darker and darker the farther it goes. There's no, there's no real payoff for this. Sometimes there will be a dog that's so jacked up on adrenaline out here, and he runs so fast that he never really gets any of this. 
and he still gets just hooked to this chase and we can talk about that later and we do talk about it in our videos, yeah, in and, stuff. videos and stuff but in this case we're just going to talk about that that middle of the, the road general, dog. yeah yeah the, the general, general idea, idea. And so it's interesting with this we see too where they start because they enjoy being on point they still are trying to get closer they'll do the catwalk and the creep and then the birds fly and so then they start thinking i better stop farther back and i better stop farther back and then pretty soon they just stop moving all together because yeah. those late season birds that we get on the late season wild birds i mean the dog turning its head will bust those birds out oh, of yeah. the brush you know so they get to where they realize pointing is the greatest thing because if i move a muscle they're gone yeah and and they and they do love it we'll walk up to dogs and the intensity is almost so much that there's like a vibrate a, a tiny bit of shake in their whole body drool hanging off yeah. their lips you know eyes bulging yeah, out of their head they're just <laughs> loving this experience yeah and and because there's no benefit once the birds fly they get away then they start just holding them you know they yeah. start to hang out and really hold that point and it creates some just amazing wild bird dogs where they'll do things that we've got some awesome stories of dogs doing yeah. things that are just amazing to get you birds to, pinned and pointed yeah. because they know once they're gone game's over so let's keep them on the ground let's let's point these and and really yeah let the game <laughs> when keep going if you will you know when tanner first got into this i, I was running a young and, and i was really learning to develop in in allowing the dog to learn from the wild birds mm -hmm. at that time you know i was really applying myself to try to get into the wild birds as much as possible and watching my dogs develop and, and giving them the opportunity to develop and um and so tanner was was part of a very memorable experience that we've got a youtube video called nick ledged out so if you mm -hmm. haven't seen that check us out at teasedoghouse.com or not at no, tease uh, doghouse on youtube so Tease Doghouse on YouTube, and there's a video of Nick ledged out, and Tanner got to be part of it, but we watched Nick work a running covey, a, a covey that was very evasive, and, and he worked them on that hillside for a little bit. Like, we were a ways away. We let our dogs, up here you can see your dogs a long ways, um, the places that we hunt, and, um, you know, so it's not unusual for our dogs to be four or 500 yards in there and hunting, and us still be able to see them and, mm -hmm. and watch what they're doing. And he was on a hillside hunting these birds, and we knew they were moving because he was moving. So that's another thing that I'm going to point out is in the natural process, that dog, when he has the bird, he slows his feet down. But when the bird starts is leaving, then he tends to go with the bird. Mm -hmm. And they'll learn how to go with the birds, not go put them up because they're trying to keep them on the ground. We'll talk about that because that's a little bit more advanced. But, but that's important to point out, though, for our point is that, that they do move here when they have the bird. Mm -hmm but they do it in an effort to pin the, to bird, pin the bird to keep, to keep the, bird, the bird to keep the bird on the ground and the reason if they let why they the run away they lose the bird the same way if they let the bird fly away right you know so they they do things to keep the birds on the ground yeah and so that, that to stay in to, contact yeah to stay in contact with the birds is yep. what we're talking about that's great and the thing that happens which we talked about with my dog babe is as they get slower and slower and more stationary on those wild birds it gives us the chance to get closer and closer. Yep. And then this has become, in their mind, this is all a shade of gray because it means the game ended. The bird got away because they've never had anything positive. Once they start seeing this as loss, once they start saying, I don't care much for chasing, my feet hurt, I'm tired, I'm hot, whatever it is that helps mm -hmm. them start to realize that there isn't much to gain once that bird goes airborne. But there's a lot to gain when they're pointing. So this is the avoidance area. This is the gain area for the dog. This is where he's getting a rush and, a, and, and really enjoying it. And this is the part that tapers off. Sometimes in, in the past, like if you go straight wild birds, sometimes there's dogs that take three seasons before they really, and if they're not hunted very much, it might take a dog's whole lifetime to become really great because he only sees wild birds X number of times a year, you know, mm -hmm. but the ones that get hunted real regular, I mean, it, it can take a couple seasons before they settle in. Most of the time, until they really get to be a great bird dog, it's third or fourth season, you know, yeah. and and so and there's things that we can do to help speed that up. But um, yeah, so that's where the dog is. But because he's standing on point long enough, we get there, and then when we flush the bird, we shoot the bird, and that can be a positive for the dog. Mm -hmm. So now. Now this 40-yard range or this kill zone, 
if we put the dog, bird up is a reward for the dog. But if the dog puts the bird up, it realizes, if I flush it, the game's over. But if I hold it until the hunter gets there and he flushes it, then he can make that thing fall out of the air, mm -hmm. right? And we can talk about real quick, some dogs love the retrieve. Some dogs like my babe dog, I never remember her picking up a bird. Mm -hmm. I never discouraged her from it, but she just didn't have an didn't interest. Have an She'd interest. go sniff it. I don't know if she didn't like the feathers in her mouth, probably, especially when she was hot. I don't, I don't know, but she didn't have any desire. So it wasn't a payday because of that, but I think she just liked the experience of the bird coming down and me shooting it. Maybe she's, maybe she's, you know, maybe they're, they're playing off of our excitement and our pleasure that we got to shoot the bird. And so that mm -hmm. they know that's a great thing too. But we can't deny that standing on point is rewarding. It's a reward for the dog. Yeah. So that in a nutshell, there's a lot of things we could talk about, you know, and, and diagram out and, and discuss all of dog training. But that's what happens in the natural process. The dog just starts to figure out that when the bird's in the air, the bird goes to the flyaway zone, the game ends for him. Once he quits thinking that chasing is such a, a blast and, and chasing loses its fun, then that really shifts. That shifts to where now pointing, boy, it just amplifies the the pleasure and the excitement of pointing and that dog will hunt all day long and kill himself to find a bird to have the opportunity to stand on point mm -hmm. some of them also love the opportunity to retrieve some bird dog some pointing breeds or pointing dogs love getting their mouth on the bird love to retrieve the amount of requests that we get for um, retrieve training and help with the retrieve lets me know that that's not as big a portion as we think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's yeah. there's from not all different types of breeds. All, all, you know, types, of all breeds. types of breeds. We get all types, the... and and there's I think sometimes in the in the retrieving or when we shoot the bird, we're so eager to get the bird, we don't want the dog to eat the bird. We don't want we're hoping to mount the bird. We don't want him to mess it up. Whatever the excitement is to get the bird back, I think a lot of times we discourage even the ones that do have some natural desire to pick the bird up. Um, so, and, and we'll, we'll make videos and talk about that too, because oh, there's cool. a lot for the retrieve. But I want to point that out because there is a thought that shooting the bird is the ultimate reward for the dog. And I, I don't want to give the idea that I, that I don't think that retrieving is a phenomenal reward for a lot of dogs that love mm -hmm. to retrieve. But I know a lot of dogs that are willing to retrieve, that don't love to retrieve, and it's definitely not the most rewarding part. The most part, exciting part of it. Right? Thing. And then I know dogs that love to find them and point them, but don't care to touch them at all. And mm -hmm. so to say as a blanket statement that the greatest reward is to shoot the bird for the dog, I, I don't see how that's true. Because mm -hmm. it can't be a blanket statement because I know way too many dogs that it, it could care they, they could care less. Mm -hmm. That's just when their pleasure ended <laughs> was when we got there, kicked the bird up and shot it. And they are just eager to go find the next one to point because they, yeah. and they stay eager. And, and those are, I mean, I've seen some hard driving dogs that never picked up a bird or never were even allowed to because the person wanted them steady to wing shot and fall, you know, or however that works, but they still have the drive. So the point to this is crystal clear, all positive, all gain. Nature adds negatives over here because of just the fact that the game ended and the dog got no reward Mm -hmm. Once it gives up the chase through the flyaway zone, then, then, then that's it, right? So that's the natural process that, and there's a lot of people that hunt their dogs. They never teach their dog whoa, and their they dog puts the birds the in the bag process. all the time. And when the birds fly, they shoot the birds, and the dog, it's allowed to move as soon as the birds fly, and, and they don't have a problem with it at all. Some hunters prefer it if their dog's retrieving because they think that'll put the dog on the bird better, you know? And, and so... The thing is, is that, that the dog learned it because of this natural process. And if we were to color this all in, in colors, then it's crystal clear and white, and then it turns to darker shades of gray. Because even if the guns, if, if the hunter's shooting the birds and the dog loves the retrieve, the retrieve only lasts so long. They know when the hunter's shot and missed, and they know that the game's over. Yeah. And they give up this flyaway zone, this, this far flyaway zone, just becomes dark. They know that there's no point in it, right? And that's a natural yeah. process. So what we see happen when man gets involved, and the reason that my dogs, my first dog was my greatest, the reason that I think a lot of people's first dogs 
are their greatest bird dog and then it takes a whole bunch of learning and experience before they have a bird dog like that again is their first dog because of the the human's lack of knowledge of training then the bird dog that got to follow a natural process but then when the human got involved he started running the dog and he said my dog is chasing those birds off and that's a problem so i need to train my dog not to chase the birds off so he uses a check cord or he uses um yeah usually he puts them on a check cord and he check plants a pigeon or, woe or, or uh, yep teaches them the word whoa with whoa you know and, yep. yeah those uses an e-collar to help reinforce whoa and and that's the training now we're going to teach him what whoa means we're going to teach him that the belly that the belly collar the e-collar means whoa um, we're going to put them on a check cord and then we're going to bring them in here and we're going to use the check cord and those things to help let the dog know that it's not to advance on the yeah. bird we're going to help the dog stop back here and then we're going to come in and shoot the bird and that's going to be the dog's reward and so what we see happen is we add little my marker was left open too long while i was talking right here. we add these little bits of negative And everybody's different in how they use the check cord and how they say whoa and, and how demanding they are. And every dog's different in its ability to handle correction. Some dogs really have a hard time with correction and some dogs, it doesn't matter to them, matter. right? And, and so, but we add, we start adding some negatives out in here where the dog has to think about us and has to start thinking about mistakes and being corrected and then over here in the flyaway zone i'm not i want to be clear that this is we we went to the other extreme we yeah. showed the one extreme of the natural process we're showing the other extreme of a human getting really involved mm -hmm. and i understand that people are all over the board in there so yeah, so i don't want to different levels of involvement yeah 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 so some people are very very talented in this area and add very little <laughs> you know and other people me when i was trying to become the trainer you know i was rough on the check cord i was whoa you know stop them and get them to point and and then my dog sometimes well anyway we'll talk about what it leads to so so we got these negatives in here and, and when we say negative we're meaning things that the dog is going to avoid avoid right, right. so yep. we're yep. not meaning good and bad no we're just meaning that these are we're adding things that the dog is saying that's the reason in under this method that the dog stands still is because it wants to avoid that check cord yeah. pulling on it, right? Right. Or avoid the the whoa word right. because it knows that that means. Or it wants to turn feet. off the the buzz from the belly right. collar. It wants to turn yeah, off the so pressure on saying, its neck. We're adding things it wants to avoid. Avoid. Yep. And we're getting involved in the dog's mind. We're mm -hmm. we're causing the dog to have to think a little bit about, about us, us and what it's doing instead of only being connected the dog to the bird. Mm -hmm. Now the dog and us and everything's all involved in this in this situation. And so we just need to be conscious that we start interrupting and we and we erase some of how crystal clear this is. And so this area becomes shades of shades of gray. And how how aware you are, how you read your dog, how you use your tools, how you all those kinds of things um, changes how gray this is one person and how the dog reacts to things changes how gray this is mm -hmm. right and then the dog goes in the air and the gun gets shot the bird goes in the air oh yeah unless it's a really talented yeah dog, i mean i've but... seen some dogs go in the air pretty high in an effort to catch the bird <laughs> but so the bird goes in the air the dog's taught to stand the bird goes in the air and the bird shot so now we're adding some positives over here right mm -hmm. we're adding what the dog wants to gain this area is becoming pretty crystal clear white so that's the part i really want to that that's what we want to really focus on a minute is now our involvement has started to taint maybe in just little bits mm -hmm. and in other situations big bits right some some dogs this becomes tainted enough that they stand and flag or when somebody stops them, they get confused and think, how do I release this pressure? Or uh, what do you want me to do? 
and then the dog starts thinking about things that worked positively before that that and so then it sits yep. or lays down or it lays down to escape mm -hmm. this pressure that it's feeling and and so a great trainer realizes those things and backs off and you know so so they're adjusting they're adjusting how gray this is the mm -hmm. the handler is trying to adjust how gray this is and then he gets a dog and he says "Ooh, this has become gray enough i need to add some positive so an interesting thing because a dog ties backwards then you can add enough positive here that that starts to creep over to here and the dog starts saying well this is not really this great situation i am a little bit concerned about my actions and i'm being pretty careful over here about what i do because i don't want to get in trouble not because he doesn't want to make the bird fly but because he doesn't want to get in trouble and and we can lighten that by shooting the bird over here making this so positive that it starts to bleed this way and the dog knows but something good is coming if i can just endure and not get in trouble here something good's going to come mm -hmm. right and then we get dogs that they they might go and find so these are some of the problems that this can lead to we already talked about sitting lying down um, flagging um, even blinking mm -hmm. if this got bad enough or or even a little bit of partial blinking where they're just not looking that hard for the bird anymore right yeah. we've seen those things we've seen it with our own eyes where dogs that were great at finding the bird suddenly seem to find less birds and it has something to do with the gray that's involved in this area because mm -hmm. if there's great grays in this area too then that can bleed over into this area and so this becomes gray this becomes more white because that's where the shot happens and the flyaway zone, sometimes the flyaway zone's the best place to get to, <laughs> right? Because it's escaping the handler that's back here mad because it made the bird fly away. Mm -hmm. So if it can chase the bird, get far enough, and handlers, often they're like, oh, man, they're whoa, whoa, whoa. And then the bird goes in the air, and they're like, oh. And then they talk to their buddy while their dog chases the birds across the hillside. Mm -hmm. So this became gray and it got wider the farther it got out here mm -hmm. and lots of problems can come up they don't always come up but lots of problems can come up depending on the dog's interpretation how easily the dog is to upset um, how gray the handler makes this area mm -hmm. so but but that's what we see when man gets involved here right is that we see gray more things to avoid less things to worry about as we get out here yep. birds fall out of the sky that's a huge positive nothing to worry about the owner quits yelling and screaming because the birds got away so now we've gotten rid of him and we're chasing and just having a time of our life here and and we get a lot of problems that build from that mm -hmm. dogs that purposefully put birds up because they'd rather chase them than stop and stand and let the owner get there where he can start yelling whoa and shocking on the collar and and doing things to to taint that experience yeah so yeah, I think that's why too we see where there's kind of the where you see the two camps that they don't really get along a lot and where you hear things about how training <laughs> hurts you on the wild birds yeah, is because pigeon it's training inverse yep. a, a lot of times it's either all gray or it's sometimes inverse where gray where white was gray and gray is white you know it's inverse of the wild birds and so it's the dogs aren't thinking in a way that they can go onto the wild birds and be like, oh yeah, I've done this before. I know what to do. I know the game. I just need to figure out how to play it on this field. Yeah. But it's a completely different game, an opposite game. And that's where I think people talk about two on the wild birds, things get bigger. And so dogs go out and it's a couple hundred yards from you and it goes on point, but it's worried about moving its feet because it knows that that's a bad thing and the birds run away and we think, oh, this dog just falls points a lot. Or, you know, we see things like that, too, where it mm -hmm. might not be that it false points a lot. It might not be that it's It just doesn't the dare follow the birds. Yeah, it doesn't know how to yeah. work the birds in a way that's going to help it learn how to be a, a, a real successful wild bird dog. And so, and it's all because of where the pressure is, changes the way the dog thinks about the game. And yeah. so it's, it's really playing two different games under these two different right. thought processes. You know, when we put the bird in a box and we know where that is, then we start dictating things to the dog 
because right, we know where the bird is. We know that's as close as we want him to get. We um, and and we can use a check cord to slow him down or keep him from going forward. And I, I can't I can't tell you how many times I've had people come and say, the problem my dog's having is it's creeping. It's cat walking in. It's creeping. It just wants to get closer and closer and closer until it's it's just right there at the trap, and. And I can't get it to stop and, and stand back here when it first smells the bird. It just wants to go all the way to the trap. But a wild bird would never let that happen. Yeah. There's going to be a point where that dog, that wild bird's going to leave at some point. That dog's going to keep trying to get closer and closer and closer, and that wild bird's going to leave. And eventually that dog's going to say, I guess I can't get that close. I better stop sooner. Yep. And, and that stopping back here gets the rewards. Making the bird fly is the end of the game. And that's the natural process. But when we put the pigeon in the box and we pin it to the ground and then we bring the dog in on the check cord, then we're trying to stop it from getting closer when what we need to be doing is well, getting the bird, the bird in. Stopped. That's what a wild bird would do. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a little example of how often people use pigeons and they're counter to what the wild bird would do. Mm -hmm. They leave the natural process and they enter this man-made process that's not natural. And then... The other things that we hear all the time is my dog's bored. My dog's bored with this game with the pigeon. Mm -hmm. And I can tell it's bored because he just doesn't care anymore. I think, I don't think he's bored. I think it's become negative. I don't mm -hmm. think it's fun anymore. Yeah. It's not that exciting anymore. You know, and so, so, and that tells us that we've added shades of gray to that experience. But when he's on wild birds, he's good. And, and on, but on wild birds, he's not broke. On pen-raised birds, he'll stand broke. He'll watch yeah. him fly away. He's steady to wing shot and fall on pen-raised birds. On, on um, the pigeons in the box or on the liberated bird that I've made him woe and stand still for. But on the wild birds, he, he breaks as soon as the birds go mm -hmm. in the air or he's having a hard time getting the wild birds pointed. Or So those are all things that we hear, and that's why. It's because we've, we've, we've reversed things. Our shades of gray are over here. And it gets clean and white when it gets over here. This is the more desirable area is once the bird goes in the air. This is the grayer area. And our natural tendency as humans, once we get the dog into that way of thinking, is to hold it, which creates more grayness. And then all, all holds barred now. Yeah. Now, as soon as the bird's in the air, you're free to do whatever. I'm going to shoot them, go get them, retrieve them for me, whatever. Yeah. The reward is the bird going into the air and... They're going to tolerate and do enough of this to get us there, to get the birds in the air. But that results in less style and more problems, potentially. Yeah. Some dogs get through it fine, but, but it weeds out a lot of dogs. A lot of dogs. Yeah, because of that. Yeah. So you think that's pretty clear? We yeah. Got yeah, that across to that, everybody? That understanding what the dogs are thinking in both situations is important because if you're going to be using a training process you should have a reason for using it you know yeah. use it just because that's how it's always been done i think is that's just how everybody did it yeah, yeah. it's a, it's an easy trap to fall into but i think intentionally doing things is always far more productive yeah and Un understanding why you're doing things is more productive and so yeah i think that that's important because that's our whole the whole idea behind our program is that we're trying to replicate that natural process. So we use the pigeons and the launchers and stuff like that, but we don't add any of the negative here. But we use, like you were talking about with the pigeon, the bird will dictate if the dog got too close. Yeah. We're not trying to stop them beforehand or do anything that says you can't go farther than that. We're just making the birds get away. The yeah. same way the wild birds would get away until finally the dog said, you know, I'm not winning that game, so let's, yeah. let's try and figure out how to play it when a way it, that I will win. When, and when, it's not to say either, we talk about the check cords and belly collars and e-collars and teaching the word woe and all that stuff, and that's all stuff we do in our program too, but it's not used here. Right. <laughs> you know, that's our whole program is we teach all those same things, but, but we don't use it before the flight of the bird. The right. flight of, before the flight of the bird is you do whatever you need to do, but yeah. if that bird gets away... Yeah. game's over and yeah. that's how it'll be on the wild birds too and that's what's going to create a dog that's really savvy about the wild birds that really can say yep i know how to get these things pinned because i was allowed to make the mistakes to learn how close i could get i was allowed to make the mistakes of yeah. where i could go and what i could get away with and now i know exactly how far i can push it to really get those birds pinned down to where they're not going to move and it's really a balancing act of yeah. of <laughs> enough pressure they stop moving but not so much pressure they so fly it, yeah it's a it's a different thing 
too, when, when you're training, when you're trying to teach the dog how to interpret and think through what's happening rather than just dictating to the dog its actions. Because if, if we dictate the actions, then we take the dog's creativity away. But we really can't be a wild bird with a pigeon. Mm -hmm. I can't do it. I, I can't. I haven't figured out how to set up with a pigeon in a trap that the pigeons run, that they act like the wild birds yeah. that they... So the dog can't become fully a wild bird dog. He has to have experience in the wild birds to learn how to handle wild birds. But what I can do is help the dog understand that you're where you are in comparison to that bird. The closer you get, the higher the chance is that the bird's going to fly. Mm -hmm. the, f the farther you stand off, the less chance the bird is that, it, that the bird's going to fly. And I can help it realize that what happens to scent and how to tell, is there a bird there or was there a bird there? Mm -hmm. You know, is this where a bird has been or is this where a bird is currently? I can help a dog start thinking through those things if I run my program right, if I yep. introduce things and handle things right with those birds. And then when it gets into the wild birds and it smells the bird and it's moving towards the bird and the bird gets up and leaves, its brain can say, I got too close. And if yep. its goal and its desire when I put it into the wild birds is to keep the bird on the ground, not to avoid making the bird fly, that's avoidance again. I want to gain. His gain is to keep the bird on the ground. If that's his goal in his mind is to keep the bird on the ground and he starts making adjustments because the bird got up and got away, but he's already been helped to understand that that had to do with the pressure he was putting on the bird, how close he was getting to the bird, then he's going to start tying things together quickly in the wild birds. He's going to mm -hmm. start saying, oh. And if he's already learned how to tell scent, how to work a scent cone, how to start to read, is that where the bird is or is that where the bird was? then he's going to start working through when he smells the wild bird and when the birds start running, he's going to work through that. And if he's already realized that when he sees birds, he's already developed a desire to be cautious when he sees birds and point them sightwise instead of saying, I can see it, I'm going to get it, which is the puppy thing for a dog to yeah. do. If, if they've been coached through all those kinds of things, there's just, there's just so much we can do with the pigeons that complements and agrees with the laws on the wild birds. Mm -hmm the things that will happen in the wild birds, if, if we can join those together, then just like taking football players, young football players, and doing drills and doing things with them to help them understand how the game works, and then you put them into the game, well, the first time in the game, they got to play games. They have to have game experience to become a great player. Mm -hmm. But we can teach them a lot that they can... That, that will translate in the game and that when they get into the game, they'll say, I understand, I know how to make my adjustments, I know how to do these things to, to handle these bigger, faster, you know, harder hitting team that I'm against, I know how to make the adjustments because I learned in practice things that were true in games. And that's what we wanna do when we're working our dogs and when we're using pigeons is make sure we're doing it in a way that is true to wild birds. Yeah, and it all comes down to the mind again. Like yep. we talked about at the beginning, right? Helping the dogs think in a way that's going to help them be successful on wild birds. And it's like we play a lot of, we all played sports growing up, and it's fun to watch little kids play t ball. And oh, it's yeah. something like baseball. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a, the same field, but it's smaller, and the kids will hit the ball and they'll run to the wrong bases. And so we teach them, nope, you got to go to first base, and then to second base, and then to third base. And the thing that always gets me is at the very last batter, hits the ball, and then everyone runs all the way around the bases. The last batter goes all one, two, three, and then all the way to home. And the kid at home just stands there and tags everybody as they come running in, right? And that's not what a real baseball game is going to be like. That doesn't happen in a real baseball game. Right. But we teach them to think in a way that will help them be successful when they're ready to play real ball. Yeah. And it teaches the fundamentals of the game in a way that isn't going to perfectly replicate the actual game, right. but it's going gonna, it's gonna to help them be prepared to and put their mind in the right place to say, oh yeah, I know how to do this. And once they start pitching, once they start hitting, once, you know, as they get older, they progress more and more, but it's training the mind to be able to step into the wild birds and say, okay, this is very similar to what we did in that field. And so I'm going to do the things that I've already been successful in, with in the training field yeah and i'm gonna try that and then that's gonna work because that's the natural process anyway so it just helps 
helps prepare them mentally. So maybe instead of taking 500 bird contacts, it takes 300 bird contacts. Or, you know, it's hard to put yeah. numbers on it, but it's going to help them think in a way that they're quicker to get successful in the it, number of contacts way of thinking of things. Yeah, and it gives us an ability to um, bring that dog along or to give that dog repetitions that it needs, like you're saying, all throughout the year instead of only when we get to go out on wild birds, only during the hunting season, only, you know, and everybody has a different amount of time that they can get into the wild birds. But, um, but I found, cause I had a limited number of times that I can wild birds. I, I spend a lot more time in the wild birds now than I did, you know, 15 years ago when I was in the middle of a career that was very demanding with it, you know, then it was, it was hard to get away. But when I got away, I wanted to have as great a time as I could. And so the time I could spend with my dogs at home was much higher. So how do I spend that time in a way that increases the success that I can have when I do get into the wild birds? Yeah. And, and that's the whole, the whole key to it. The one other thing I want to say too is that natural process. I, I got to hunt with a gentleman, uh, this was probably six or seven years ago, and he had a setter that was three-legged still had four legs but one of them was was poor functioning he's 11 and a half or 12 years old and and we ran him with some young pups you know and the young pups were i mean young pups they were in their second year you know and they were getting birds pointed and and you could kill some birds over them and we were having a good time with them but we ran that old season pro with them and he had this was a wild bird hunter this guy was not a, he didn't have a pigeon loft at home. He didn't, you know, these dogs were allowed to go through that natural process that we talked about. And, and that old dog, um, he told me he didn't, he was no good until he was four. You know, he just, he just had a hard time putting everything together. Mm. And, and then when he was four, he started pointing birds and, and it started to happen. And this dog was a magician. Like we had these young dogs and they were zinging all over with all their young zeal and, and energy and excitement. And he just found his gear and he just rode the wind. And he just went to birds. Boom, boom. And he had all the finds. The young ones that they covered twice as much ground as him. You know, you look at your GPSs and your mileage and all that. They covered twice as much and they always just came into back. They had a few finds, but he was a machine. And it was because he had become a bird expert. He knew where they lived. He knew their habits. He knew their, you know, their ways of behaving. He knew how close he could get. He knew how to use the wind like an artist. And he'd just ride it, and then you'd just see him standing there like a million dollars. All the intensity and the style, and the, which was a big thing. He was a lame dog, and he, um, he's an old dog. And how many times do we hear people say dogs lose their style? you know as they age and as they but this dog hadn't he was Kept yeah but he was he was he was trained like by a purist you know he was it was all wild birds and it was all natural and it was all letting the dog figure things out and he was he was something to behold and that was you know that was just a real i'd already really started to to gear my program towards how do i use a pigeon in a way that can produce an old uh, an old a good dog like that you know yeah. And, and I'll mention too, again, I think we've said it already, but I, I, can't, I can't teach a dog to be like that dog I just talked about using pigeons. Mm -hmm. They become that way from being in wild birds. But I can use the pigeons with a young dog in a way that helps put the dog in the best position to learn those lessons. To learn those lessons that prevents, I don't want to tell the dog lies in the time that I spend with it on pigeons and then take it to the wild birds and have it have to figure out the truth. I want to tell it the truth so that when it gets into wild birds, it progresses. Yeah. And, and I want to teach it things that leaves it free to become an artist. If it's got it in it, if it's got it genetically ingrained in it to become a great wild bird dog, to know how to pin them when they're running, to know how to cut them off, to know how to handle them, to know where they're at and if they're running and if they're not running and how to stay with them and how to get around them and actually get them stopped from running. And some of the things that we've watched dogs do, that's just fabulous. It's amazing. And, but if we want them to be that kind of a dog, we can't do things that hinder its experience and that squelches its desire and its drive. It's a scent indicator. Yep. It's got, yeah, it can't just show an indication of game in the area. 
it, it's got to know how to go to them and point them. Mm -hmm. And to go to them and point them, that means that it already learned how to go to them and flush them. Yep. And, and you can't, you know, you, you want to do things in a way that does not dampen that drive and that excitement and that confidence that it can do what it thinks it needs to do in this zone to keep the bird on the ground. And that, that's a beautiful thing. And if we get too involved and we tell lies, we hamper that and our dogs never achieve the best that they can be. And that's what our goal is, is to help them be the best that they can be. And we do want them to do it as soon as possible, but you don't want to try to make it happen so soon that you never get the best. I would rather trade a year on the front side to have phenomenal years on the back side than to try to have a dog broke, steady to wing shot and fall at one year old that never becomes what it could have become because of the, because of the gray that I added in the wrong zone. I, I, I don't want to go there. I, I want to let that dog become its best. And if it means that I have to give it another year on wild birds to become its best, I want to do it because I want to experience years of the, years of the best. Yep. I'll, give up, I'll give up a year or two on the front side to let that dog develop and come along if that's what's required. But if I can help him and speed that up, you know, help him come to understand things a little quicker, then I'm, I'm not against that, I, I, you know. But I don't, yep, but I'm more concerned about what they're gonna become than what they are right there on that front side and how fast we get to the goal. Thanks for joining us for this podcast. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope maybe it sparked some thoughts in your mind of, of how you can help your dog become even a better wild bird dog. As I got into bird dogs years and years ago, I fell in love with the process of watching dogs learn from the wild birds. And I realized there's a very natural process that a dog goes through as it becomes a true bird specialist, a wild bird specialist that knows how to find them, knows how to get them pointed, and knows how to hold them for, its, um, for the hunters to get there. I also, just like so many, had some restraints on my time and I couldn't spend as much time in the wild birds as I wanted. So the last 20, 25 years I've spent specifically figuring out how to use pigeons at home, out in the local field, to help my dog learn the important principles that it needed to know to help it advance quickly on the wild birds. I also have worked to figure out how to use the pigeons and my training sessions to create um, a natural relationship between me and my dog where the dog understood that we were in this as a partnership and exactly what I meant through my communication. So in the last couple years we've spent um, a lot of time videoing this and creating step-by-step -step programs that help take you from your dog first coming home and learning how to be a good citizen in the house on through to a finished wild bird specialist helping you put birds in your bag. So if that interests you, check us out at teasdoghouse.com. Teasdoghouse.com is an online subscription video library. And within that library is where we've housed all of our programs, all of our step-by-step -step information. Check it out. At this time, we're promoting, we're running a promotion. If you use promo code podcast, it will get you five free days to check this the website out, see if it's something that you'd like. And then it's just $25 a month until you decide to cancel sometime, we hope, in the far distant future. <laughs> well, we're working hard to keep relevant information up there and a lot of information to help you create the wild bird dog you've always dreamed of. And you and your dog having the experiences in the wild that, that we just read books about. So thanks for joining us and um, hope you love the podcast. Uh, or hope you love the, the website. Remember, podcast is the promo code you want to sign up with to get your five days free. Anytime you want to end your subscription, you can in your account. And anytime you want to restart your subscription in the future, you can do that through your account also. Thanks for joining us. Hope you love it all. And we hope to have you along for many of our wild experiences coming up. Mm -hmm.